what is good it's your man ribs so we finally got it and that's this giant book that you see here this is called contact high by vicky toback this is a book i've been chasing for a minute uh basically it's it's perfect for a hip-hop head if you love hip-hop music you love rap music and you love the history of it it's all contained in this book so i'm going to jump in here show you a couple picks some of my favorite ones and we'll talk about kind of what the value of this book is all right y'all so here's the book it's called contact high a visual history of hip-hop by vicky toback i love this book basically purely because of the aesthetic first and foremost as you can see on the cover here this is just basically a mosaic of different uh, negative images from various contact sheets and the whole point of this book is showing you not only the beautiful images of, of the history of hip-hop but then also the images around it so, so you can see here for example this particular image is squared off meaning let's say that's the one that they're going to select for publication then the rest of them won't see the day of light because they're the kind of the the off cuts from the contact sheet and one here for example has an x another one right here has an x with tupac's image and so on and so forth and that whole motif of kind of the contact print goes across everywhere and, and also the negatives you can see here this says the name of the author or at least the curator and then the name of the book and this looks like a sheet where you would keep your negatives uh, one of those plastic sheets so i just love this and the other thing is this book is big you can see my hand here hold it here for scale it's a pretty big book it's hard cover it's it's nice great quality and you've got massive prints like this one right here 50 cent where you can see you know this incredible tattoo that he has and obviously his bullet wounds and that kind of thing so really really beautiful stuff here um let's go ahead and jump in so as i mentioned this book is a history of hip-hop meaning that they actually kind of span the entire let's say 30 plus years of hip-hop history and to open up the book there's actually a chronology here that you can see we won't get into that because that's not pictures but ultimately you know I think that the thing to say here is that this book is going to give you a bit of a history lesson in hip hop and the images that you see here, starting with, you know, 1979, as it says up there, uh, you have this beautiful, big contact print right here of all the negatives. And then this is the first real image of the book. And then, you know, fast forward from 1979 all the way to what is it? 2000 and it looks like 2011 is the last entry here of title, the creator. So it's Los Angeles, 2011. That is a long time. That is roughly 30 years of hip hop history across images. And like I said, you've got these massive prints right here. I mean, look at this, the size of someone's face basically in real life. So I just, I love it. I absolutely love it. And yeah, I think aesthetically, that's kind of what you take from this book is the fact that you have a lot of giant prints like this one, for example, Biggie, and a lot of contact prints here of the actual negatives that made up the, the role that were, that composed of that particular image. So as I mentioned, the beauty of this book has to do with the contact sheets that you see here. And this one, for example, features the rapper Red Band. And ultimately, with these contact sheets, you get a sense of what the photographer was thinking. You get to see it visually here. You get to see how they kind of dance around the scene and how they actually capture the images that they want to capture. I want to go specifically to one of the most famous images you'll find of hip hop ever. And that is on this particular page here. And we've got this giant print on the right here of MF Doom. And then on the left, we have the actual uh, contact sheet. And I pulled this one up specifically because here you really see a photographer working. You know, you start out with your basic portrait up here and then you see the photographer work his way around the entire scene. And in this case, the scene is very plain. It's kind of like a porch or a balcony next to a building, but his subject MF Doom is positioned in many different ways, different angles different um, kind of poses using his equipment there, which is an MPC or some sort of a mixer. Um, and it's just beautiful to see the work that the photographer did to kind of scope out the entire scene. And interestingly enough, the final image that was selected, and I think this was ended up being an, an album cover, and it's definitely the most famous image of MF Doom, is the one noted right here. And that's the one, it's kind of the most minimalist of all the images. There's tons of negative space in it. You can see here on the right, tons of negative space on the actual crop and his face is is big and predominant but it doesn't take up the entire image it kind of creates this air of mystery and mf doom was always surrounded by mystery because of the mask that he was wearing so i really love how the contact sheet here on the left shows you that kind of thought process and ultimately how you narrow down that whole shoot into one famous image and it brings it all together nicely like i said you've got the air of mystery with mf doom you know, it showcases his mask, which is this signature thing that everybody knows him for. 
And yeah, it's just very plain. MF Doom was not a showy rapper. He wasn't out there with the, the cars and the girls and you know and the jewelry. He was just himself and his words. And I think the portrait that you see here ultimately beautifully showcases that exact principle. All right, let's go ahead and turn to another page here. I wanna look at some portraits of Nas was covered very nicely in this book on page 125, I believe. Nope, not 125, that's Tupac. We'll get to that in a second. Here we go, page 121. So I love this portrait right here, this giant one that you see right here. And basically, this particular portrait was taken with a Horizon camera, which as you know, or may not know, is that famous um, panoramic camera that actually has a lens that rotates in the front and allows you to get a wide image that spans from that side all the way to there. Because of that rotating element, you do get a lot of distortion around the corners um, and around the edges, which is why you see these cars kind of be very elongated. But even here, this actually looks pretty good and the horizon isn't that messed up. And of course, the human subject in here, Nas, looks pretty good. He's not distorted in any meaningful way. So the reason I love this is because, you know, the camera that was used for this to do the panoramic shot matches the output that you see there. The panoramic was super intentional here and it wasn't gimmicky. The whole point was to showcase Nas, you see here, in the middle of his entire environment. And his environment in this case is the Queensbridge Project, which you see in the background here. Um, you're, now you put Nas in this case in the streets of where he's from and this is how you get to see and get to know who he is and kind of what he's about. And this also has a couple key symbols here about New York City that I love. So first and foremost on the corner you've got the bodega right here which is you know, emblematic of, of kind of the streets of New York, especially in the hoods. And then of course you got these cars here, which are a bit dated. Um, these are probably Cadillacs, if I can tell by the spokes here on the wheels. I don't know what this one on the right is, but this one gives me Cadillac vibes or maybe Oldsmobile or something. Either way, these cars are from the 90s, maybe late 80s, and therefore you know, it kind of dates the photo. You can tell that Nas is quite young in this image. And the photographer wanted to convey that. The photographer wanted to put Nas in his environment and communicate to the audience exactly you know, who he is and where he's from. And honestly, I don't know if there's a camera that would have done it better than the Horizon did in this case. And if we look at the contact sheet down below, here you see a couple other images. I actually think the photographer chose the right one that's printed up here. As you can see, it's selected in the contact sheet down below. And I think that's the best one of the bunch. I do like this one right here that features a portrait of some people, uh, probably some neighborhood kids surrounding Nas. And they're obviously distorted because the horizon's not really suited for that kind of work up close, but I think it looks cool. And I think, again, it really does a good job of jamming things into the scene, showcasing as much as possible of whatever scene you're, you're kind of showing in front of it. So I just really love this image and it's so unique. You know, a lot of portraits at the time were not shot with horizon cameras. So seeing one here that was so intentionally done um, is great and it, it really brings me some joy. All right, the last portraits I wanna show you here are actually the ones I mentioned earlier of Tupac. And that is on page 125. And I pulled these one out specifically for kind of two reasons. Number one is these images are shot with a Pentax 6.7, which is a camera that I recently purchased and I absolutely love. You can see here, you got your 10 negatives, big images. I just love this. The second thing is that the photographer intentionally cross processed these images. And the whole point was to kind of pull out some different colors and a different feel. He says here in, the, in kind of the quote that they capture, um, it says, it really stands out as a powerful image and as it was shot with a Pentastic 7 using Kodak cross-process film, so there's no color correction. The image is fun and defiant and I believe that's why so many people identify with Tupac. It stirs up a lot of emotion. I think that's a beautiful way to capture what the photographer has done here. You've got these really interesting colors, especially in the background that really make you think about where are you? And it gives off this like psychedelic playful attitude which I think definitely matches a lot of the, the vibe of Tupac. And then the duality of it is of course, you've got Tupac throwing up the middle fingers. That's a bit less playful, maybe a bit more aggressive. And that's kind of the, the whole identity of Tupac. It was kind of the best of both worlds. You had this beautiful poet who really has some down to earth aspects to him. And then you had a little bit of a rough side, you know, aggression and anger and all of that combined. In this contact sheet right here, every single one of these images, in my opinion, is a keeper. And I love these group shots here. These are just so epic and they've got so much attitude and again, some of that psychedelic color aspect to it. I definitely plan on doing a bit of cross-processing of my images because I love this style. And I think in an intentional way for the right shoot with the right idea, I think you can come up with something really, really cool. One kind of closing thing that I want to point out about this book and kind of what I saw in it is, you know, the cameras and the films that were most popular or that seem to be most popular in this time according to the images I've seen here, but also things I've seen elsewhere. First and foremost is that the 6.7 format is extremely popular. 
And I get it, you know, that big negative gives you so much information to work with. And those cameras produce really beautiful kind of depth of field or lack of depth of field, let's say, that really translates into beautiful bokeh and kind of just nice environmental kind of aspects. And I think that's telling because six by seven gets you in the direction of four by five. Of course, it's one step below that, but ultimately six, seven gives you some of those qualities that people really love about four by five cameras without having kind of the slow, tedious and, and potentially cumbersome operational aspects of four by five. So I get it. If I was a studio photographer at the time, a portrait photographer, six by seven would definitely be my default. And especially back then when film was cheap and you know, the, the process of getting film developed and all this stuff, which is very normal and easy. So I get why a lot of these photographers did that. And of course, a lot of them used the Pentax 7 a lot of them used the Mamiya RZ system. So those are the cameras that are very popular and it's really cool to see that they're still extremely popular today, just as they were back then. The other thing that I noticed is that a lot of these photographers, even though there was a lot of access to color film, you know, in the 80s and all the way up until the, the 2010s, um, they shot tons of black and white. And I think there's just something beautiful about black and white. And this is something that I've come to appreciate over the last six months since I've started to shoot more and more black and white film. You can really play around. And if you look at the kind of the contact sheet scan, versus the actual end prints that were featured in the image when you compare like kind of like the best one, you can tell that they've been manipulated um, meaningfully, um, often just to kind of fix the exposure because you know, exposures aren't always correct, but also to kind of mess with them and add some contrast and do some different things, um, which is cool. And in terms of black and white, I think from what I saw, it looks like T-Max films were the most um, widely used here. My recent experience with T-Max has been great. Um, definitely love how that film resolved grain and, and kind of professional level portraiture, so I get it. But, you know, there's a lot of different things mixing around in here. But overall, I think Kodak films were the strongest kind of showcased ones here in terms of volume. I didn't really see too much straying in any other direction. Definitely some Fuji here and there, and of course some Ilford here and there, but for some reason, and maybe because all these people were mostly based in the US, Kodak was what they went with. I also, as I showed you some examples of cross-processing, um, I did notice a bit of cross-processing here. I don't know if that was a trend at the time, um, cause you know, it's hard to tell, but I saw it a lot in this book and there were some very key images that were intentionally cross-processed to achieve some interesting looks. Nowadays, cross-processing is more seen as like this novelty thing that's kind of like on the outskirts, or at least that's what I've noticed, but it seems like cross-processing was very heavy and, and normal. So lockdown is almost coming to an end here soon enough and that means libraries are gonna open here in the UK. My plan is actually to get in the library and start to look at some photo books. So I hope to do a couple more videos like this showcasing some of my favorite photo books and maybe showcase some lessons or just some interesting things that have to do with photography or maybe genres that I like and that kind of thing. So definitely be on the lookout for that. All right, y'all, that's it for today. If you like this video, please go ahead and like it and definitely go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already. Till the next video, yo, I'm out.